Hello and welcome to the latest Odds Checker betting podcast. We've previewed the first three days of the Welcome to Yorkshire Ebor Festival and we finally arrived at day four of the meeting on the Naves Mart, which of course includes the £500,000 Skybet Ebor. My name's Danny Archer, I'll be your host. I'm going to be joined by one of the best in the business, Andy Holding, Odds Checker's resident tips. To remember, you can read Andy's tips on the Odds Checker app every day and hopefully he's going to point you in the direction of more winners at york this afternoon so firstly andy we're recording this on thursday morning we've just had the draw and the decks for the ebor and the big news obviously is that the favorite the seven to one favorite live your dream is the first reserve just a quick word on the ebor itself andy in terms of a betting race what do you kind of look for uh, in terms of even form or figures when you're kind of deciding who to pick in an ebor um, well, I think the Ebor uh, has changed dramatically in the last five five or so years, isn't it? Uh, given the prize money on offer, I, I think gone are the days where um, uh, Jimmy Fitzgerald used to lay one out, such as Train Glot, and, and he used to nick in, nick in off a very lightweight. I, I think so, sometimes you know the winners of the Ebor rate, run, run off races in the eighties. Um, lightly raced three year olds used to dominate the race, but because it's very much an older horse race nowadays and, and they, the three-year-olds aren't rated high enough at this moment in their career. They're, they've got absolutely zero chance of getting in. The, the bottom rated horse is rated 101, which just tells you the, the uh, complexity of the race. Top weight, 116, which is you can Glenn. So basically, you've already got horses that are proven at group level in, in a handicap. So um, I, I, I just think it's, like I say, it's a totally different dynamic nowadays. Um, I like something that preferably that's had a run at the track. That there are trials now on offer at the track, and and uh, we saw one of those trials early on in the season, which brings together quite a few of the horses that reappose beyond Hookham. Uh, that was um, that was a month ago, and and I think that could be one of the pivotal races uh, for the Ebor, with at least two or three of them running in the Ebor itself. Plus the fact you've got your tried and trusted st- stables that do really well in it, like you have John Gosdens and your William Haggis, of course, has got a strong hand. Um, and, it, it, you know, and, and Willie Mullins is also sending one over as well. So it's a very, very complex race, one that I'm going to spend a lot of time analysing even more in depth between now and Saturday. But I have got at least three or four for this podcast podcast purposes to, uh, like I say, at least throw, uh, throw a few names into the hat. How crucial is the draw in an Ebor, Andy? Well, back in the day, I think... Um, you would probably want to be drawn nearer the rail as possible. But as time's gone on, very similar to the Ascot round track over a mile and a half, the stats say you, you want to be drawn wide. I, I think John Gosden won it with um, a horse a couple of years ago in the Hamden Al McToon colours. It was drawn 20 or 22 or something like that. I think the theory is that those that are drawn high end up getting dropped out as the horses go mad up the inside, and and then and then they end up being on the outside of the pack, and then when they swing into the home straight, they end up running down the middle on the advantageous ground, challenging towards the near side, which in the end by Saturday becomes the unpoached ground, and often horses that are deep closers and need to be held up because they're dropped out come through strongly in the Ebor. I think that's why the bias is very much swung the other way around now, and you want to be drawn high to take advantage of that scenario. So I can at least have a little bit more of an understanding of why the high numbers now have started to dominate. Okay, interesting. So we're going to kick off. We'll see another seven race card. The 150 gets us underway, the strengths will stakes, and we conclude at 520. Just before we start, let me point you in the direction once again of the Odds Checker app. It's the best place to compare odds, extra places, and offers between the major bookmakers. And you'll also get free daily tips from Andy and many more. So it's all right with you, Andy, just because we haven't got the betting through for the strength stall stakes yet. We'll start with the £125,000 Sky Bet Melrose handicap at 225. Bet 365 already priced this up, and we've got Dushan as the 7 to 1 favourite. Mosha was 8 to 1. Summer's Knight is also 8 to 1. Imperial Sun, King of the Castle, Surrey Gold are all there on 10 to 1. Parachute and Valley Vorge at 10 to 1. And we've then got Marshall Plan, Tashcan, True Courage and f- on 14 to 1. And it's 16 to 1 bar. Ultra competitive, Andy. 7 to 1 the field. But who do you like in the Melrose? Um, first and for- foremost, Daniel, I think this race is very similar to the, the Boodles or the Old Friend Winter um, at the Cheltenham Festival. 
I'm um, using a com- direct comparison. What what you end up having uh, with the the juvenile hurdlers, horses that have um, started their career very late, um, they end up just having a very very small sample size for the handicapper to get hold of them before they they then run in their championship events, i.e. the handicap at, at the festival, uh, based on very very slim pickings. And I think it's quite difficult for the handicapper sometimes to. Um, assess them correctly because a lot of them are just being run specifically to get as low a mark as possible. Some of these in the male rows have shown their hand a little bit, but they are basically late developing types that have only had maybe one or two runs as a two-year-old and maybe three or four runs this season. Some of them are progressing at a a rate of knots better than others. Um, so it's, it's, I always find this race a, a very, very trappy race to try and work out. I do like trying to work it out. I always have a, a real good crack at it. I'll probably end up back in a couple. Um, it's interesting that Dushan, the favourite here, Dan, has he's the only representative for, for William Haggis. It's a race that William's done really well in the past. Wink of an eye, interestingly, was rated 91, runs against the older horses early on in the week. We've discussed him. He could have easily come... Dushan. And Dushan was rather undone by the way that the race panned out uh, the other day at Ascot. Um, he, he just didn't really get run to suit him. It was a horse called First Goal won the race of, of, of John and Daddy Gosden's, but it, it basically developed into a sprint. So he's done really well considering where he was, turning for home to finish second. There was another horse that was inconvenienced by that um, race as well, which was Surrey Gold, who was sent off three to one second favourite that day, Hugh Morrison's horse. He was last turning for home and he had absolutely no chance. I think a more evenly run race will definitely suit him. So you can see why those are eight to one respectively, given their strong form lines going into that Ascot race and that didn't work out for them. Um, there's a horse that I quite like here um, called Heart of Fault. Now he's drawn 21 of the 22 runners. So I'm, I'm not absolutely overjoyed with that, but tradition says that you're not totally a million. Um, but I really like this fellow. He won it. Carlisle a couple of starts ago. He beat a horse of Roger Verri's called Priano, who's gone on to win since. He then went to the racing, one of those racing league uh, races the other night at Newcastle, and they dropped him right out the back. And it ended up being a bit of a tactical tactical affair, and they kicked off the home turn, and he got badly outpaced before running on eye-catching. He only got beat four lengths. Uh, the form's worked out really well. The second has won since, Lyford. And I think he's the type that could really do well come of age in a race like this. Um, I see his opening prices in around the 25 to 1 mark. But uh, he's trained by Tim Easterby, who has already had a good win at this meeting with Copper Knight. So he shouldn't be underestimated. Um, and he's definitely one that I'll be looking towards um, with the potential of putting him up. But like I say, it's early days. I've mentioned Douche, I mentioned Surrey Gold. Valley Forge is another horse I quite like. So a lot will depend between now and then what, where I'll end up pinning my tail on the donkey, as it were. Okay, interesting. Hard to fort currently a twenty to one shot. And interesting, Andy mentions Lidford. He, as we're recording on Thursday, he runs tonight at Windsor again. So the form he does, yeah, could be could be Frank's once again. Just one quick horse wanted to mention: King of the yeah. Castle. He looks like Ryan Moore's <laughs> going over to the Curragh on Saturday. William Buick comes in for the ride. He's got to defy top weight, but he could be unexposed despite some questions about the O'Brien Yards form at the minute. Yeah, some well, basically a lot of the a lot of the odd struggle over here. I mean. There's been the odd exception, such as some old Basilica, but a lot of these three-year-olds and older horses in particular haven't done as well as they have done in previous years. Love yesterday, of course, and and Sir, and Sir Lucan to a, a smaller degree. Um, but King of the Castle, yeah, I've, I've watched him intently over in Ireland, and he's got strong form lines. He was second in the uh, the Ulster Derby behind his stable companion in Iowa. That was a very good time figure. Um, he beat a horse called um, Sinapachi last time out, and Sinapachi found the form with a victory uh, the other night. Um, I think it was at Garen. So he's definitely come of age. He seems to be quite an honest galloper. He wears the cheek pieces. That 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 seems to have made a difference in his um, his general outlook. I'm not necessarily sure he's that wildly handicapped off 96. Mm. I think what he's done over in Ireland is decent, but I think there's better better handicapped horses and stronger form lines over in this um, in this country than has been over in Ireland. 
Okay, interesting. So hard to fall to 20 to 1 for Andy in the Melrose. And as he also mentioned, William Haggis has a good record in the race, having won it in 2012 with Guarantee and in 2019 with Hamish, who is set to run in the e ball later on on Saturday. We then come at three o'clock to the Skybet City of York Stakes, a group to event over seven furlongs, and it sees Safe Voyage bid to uh, retain his title in this event. But currently the betting has... So Space Blue is the favourite at eleven to eight. Primo Baccio at five to two. Safe Voyage is seven to one. Sabuska so at nine to one. Glorious Journey ten to one. Pogo fourteen to one. Highfield Princess twenty five to one. Lord of the Lodge thirty three to one. And five thousand to one at fifty to one. So Space Blues, Andy, first off the. Were you slightly disappointed on his comeback at Goodwood, or do you feel like that will blow away the cobwebs and he should be primed for this, given he is a course and distance winner already? Yeah, very much the latter in your, in your um, um, sentence there, Dan. Um, I, th- I thought he ran really well. I know he was well fancied. He was 11 to 4 and uh, expectations were quite high, but it, it looked a very strong race at, at Goodwood. It's probably the strongest race of its kind so far this season. The likes of Kinross, uh, Happy Power, Creative Force. You know, the, the, there was a lot of very, very good specialists at seven furlongs. So if he was going to get caught out, it was going to be after that 122 day break. So you can obviously upgrade his run. Uh, the other thing as well to notice about his performance as well on the day is that he clocked the fastest section of, of, of the first four home that day. Uh, it was only by fractions. I think he did 34-2 and the winner did 34-6. So he's obviously making ground in, in the hottest part of the race. So he's come away from that contest with flying colours. He's also got a course and distance win against his name. That was back in 2019. So he likes York. And he's probably the preeminent seven furlong specialist either side of the Irish scene and, and, and France as well because he's been over on the continent quite a bit I think a lot of the French races suit him he's just a very very good horse over seven furlongs that is definitely his trip um, so I think he's the right favourite I, I think Primo Baccio his main market rival is going to be a serious contender because I think dropping back to seven furlongs will arguably suit her she's also proven out the track as well when she won early on in the season Clocking a big time when she beat Creative Flair, who obviously ties in with, with Space Blues, his Sabre companion. Her last two runs haven't really panned out as well as they might have done. She was a creditable fifth at, at Newmarket in the Falmouth. Um, she only got beat a length and a half that day, but she just wasn't in the right part of the track. And like I say, it didn't really work in her favour. Soft ground she just hated last time out at Deauville. You can, you can forget that run. Um, she just doesn't... Um, appreciate or perform to her best with with uh, give underfoot but back on fast ground it's likely to be on Saturday back to York dropping back in trip she's a real strong traveler I could see her you know at least putting it up to the favorite but I'd probably I'll probably stick with Space Blues because I think he'll come on quite considerably from that um, that first run at Goodwood and just a quick nod on Safe Voyage who won the race last year oh he's been a, a great servant I mean John Quinn has done amazingly well with him he must be, you know, um, a, a brilliant horse to have around the yard. And I think it's because of Safe Voyage that arguably the stable has managed to hit the heights they have in, in the last three or four years because he's an eight-year-old now. But they've had so many horses breaking through because they've got him to work with as a benchmark. You know, the likes of Highfield Princess and the Sprinters Keep Busy and um, one or two others in that category, Al Astronaut. Eh? Um, and, and, and I think he's likely to run his race. You know, he, he, he doesn't mind the ground. He doesn't mind the track. He's just been a little, a little bit in and out, hasn't he, so far this season? He's had three run, four runs, one victory and three complete blowouts. So he's not having that level of consistency, which he's, had, which he's been synonymous with for the last four or five years. So you do take a little bit of a chance with him, hoping that he can run to his best. Um, if he can, then he's a player. But on, 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 on balance, he's, he's likely to come up a little bit short. So Space Blues for Andy in the three o'clock of the Skybet City of York Stakes. We'll then move on to the feature, the £500,000 Skybet Ebor handicap. Over just shy of a mile and six furlongs, 22 runners go to post and live your dream. The current 7-1 to anti-post favourite is the first reserve in the race. So he needs something to come out before. When's the deadline for the horses coming out of this race, Andy? I think it's tomorrow, isn't it? I think um, providing everything gets a clean bill of health outcome, 24 hours as, as far as we, we're, this podcast is concerned, then that'll be it. So I wouldn't say it needs a miracle, but um, they'll be um, they'll be very, very hopeful or keen that something something doesn't make the gig. But um, yeah, it's looking unlikely at this stage. 
So a concern for punters, but he is the seven to one favourite. You've then got Hamish at eight to one, along with Sonny Boy Liston. Ilarab is ten to one. Tribal Craft at eleven to one. Global Storm and Mount Leinster are both twelve to one shots. Fajera Prince, Moran, Shamro are all fourteen to one. You then got away he goes, humanitarian, quick fawn, Roberto Escobar, all at sixteen to one. And it's then twenty to one bar. So a fascinating race, Andy, given the favourite <laughs> might not even line up in this event. But who do you like in the Sky Bet Ebor? Um, I, I paid attention to that race that was won by Hookham here. Um, I think it was a, just about a month ago. Um, because it looked a strong race on, at, at, at the time. The time figure was very good. And you had the kind of horses that ran in it that were likely to come here a month later and run in the Ebor. Um, so I watched that race intently. I've watched it probably about three or four times. And I've, I've taken bits and pieces out of the race. I thought Hookham put up a classic performance. He's won since, so we know the form's strong. I like the run of Fajara Prince. I didn't think he was ridden as if that day was D-Day. Um, he's a very likely race, kind of fragile horse for Fajara Prince. He only runs once or twice a season, so they have to try and get him to peak on a certain day. So I think he's likely to improve from that run. He's definitely on my short list. The horse that finished fifth is a big eye catcher. Away he goes. A horse that finished third to Subjectivist. In the Dubai World, in the Dubai Cup, over two miles out in um, out in Maidan uh, throughout the winter or our winter, um, and he very much got ridden with a view to the future. He was held about the back. Uh, he came through to have every chance two furlongs down, but he, he visibly blew up inside the last furlong or so. He's got the kind of run style which suggests that he'll be suited to a big field ebor, picking horses off, weaving through the pack. I think he should be um, un- not underestimated. And Sonny Boy Liston as well, another horse that I think um, he's likely to have a big say in the, in the uh, outcome of the Ebor. Trained by Johnny Murta, who's done really well in the last month or so. He's also seemed to be really flourishing, of course, a Royal Ascot win with great belief. Um, that was his first shot as what, against what I would call bona fide group horses over in this country. And albeit he didn't quite live up to expectations that day it wasn't a bad run and with a view to getting acclimatized to york you, you know you could you could see him improving off, off, off that run as well so it's 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 definitely a race that i'll probably end up choosing one of those two out maybe i might go for both of my selections out of that race i don't know yeah but my shortlist involves fujiara prince away he goes sunny boy list and those are my main three and the other one i quite like as well is tribal craft Mm-hmm. Be- because she's also a course and distance winner. She was really impressive when she won here um, back in um, May, beat at Urban Artist. And her next two runs have been fairly good. Uh, second to Wonderful Tonight, of course, last time we saw her at Goodwood. Um, she, you could argue that she might might want a bit of ease in the ground. That might be the only stumbling block with her. But uh, she's a very classy mare, and anything that Andrew Baldin is running at the moment, with David Probert on in particular has always got to be worthy of a second glance. So um, another one, like I say, I'm, I'm, I'm toying with at the moment. But a lot depends on what happens between the weather now and then, how I get my head around the draw. I'll probably see a few other races on the round track this week, see how the draw pans out. So a lot of um, mind juggling between between uh, now and Saturday for me to whittle it down to the final two. For Jared Prince, obviously a seven-year-old now, but still lightly raised. He, he, was, he made a pleasing comeback. But how tricky is it for a horse? To, obviously, we've only had one horse in history to win successive Ebors. Is that a slight concern for you, that record? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm not sure what's been the problem with Amy. She's been off for 428 days. Um, when he does turn up, he, he's very good. I think the, the, the key factor you've got with him is that because he, he hasn't had a run, I think William Haggis will have drilled him and got loads of work into him, you know, for a, for a, a race that's worth, what, how much is it? To the winner, three hundred grand. I mean, mm-hmm. There's no way you're going to be coming up short here. He's yeah. got enough horses to, to, in his yard to, to get this horse cherry right. But he's two for two for the track as well, Dan. I mean, he won the Melrose, didn't he, back in 2019? He followed that up win up with a, a victory there uh, thereafter, and he's got four on either ground as well. So if it does rain on Saturday, highly unlikely. But if it does, he's he's one on soft and he's one on good to firm. Mm-hmm. So you haven't got an issue on that score as well. So. Um, be very, very dangerous horse to write off. So, just in conclusion, Andy, you're two or three for the for the. Yeah, Eagles. like I say, it's, I'm, I don't want to sound too wishy washy at this stage, but I have generally got to juggle the juggle the pack between those four I mentioned: Fajera Prince, Away He Goes, 
um, Sonny Boy Liston and, and Tribal Craft. I think if you had to pin me down to just one and say, right, Andy, forget all the flannel, it, it, which one are you going to go with? I'd probably say away he goes. Okay. I, I've, I've, had him on, I've had him on my mind for this race for a little while now. And, you know, to chase home Trushan last time out at Goodwood, and we know Trushan is probably the best stayer in the country on soft ground. So, it's, well, in the, in the last two seasons, um, I think that was a pretty good effort. Uh, and he's going to be underestimated because he's trying by, without um, uh, underestimating him too much, Ishmael Mohammed. I think if he, I think if he was trained by a more preeminent name, he'd be, a, he'd be a good deal shorter. Okay. Interesting thoughts from Andy on the Skybet eball, which is live at 3.35 from York. We then move back to the opener, which is the Skybet and Symphony Group Strength Stall Stakes, a group three event over a mile, £100,000 in the prize fund at 150. And Real World looks to be quite a solid favourite, you'd think, once the market does open back up. Uh, Andy for Saeed Bin Sarot and Marco Gianni. You've got El Drama for Andrea Zini and Roger Varian. My Oberon, who's a winner at the course. And, of course, the top weight, Lord Glitters, who is a past winner of the race. But what do you make of the strength stall? Yeah, interesting betting race. Um, I, th- I think I've spotted a little bit of value here, but we'll talk about the favourite real world. Um, I mean, he's just been a huge improver. I mean, it, it, was, it, was, a, it was an audacious um, uh, move, wasn't it, to run in a handicap for the first time in this country, anyway, um, in the uh, Hunt Cup off the back of a 97-day break, sticking the cheek pieces on for the first time. Mm. And he was one of the gambles of the race, if you remember. I think he was 50-1 to in the morning, and he ended up going off 18-1, to and he absolutely destroyed a high-class field of handicappers. The the Hunt Cup this season, excuse me, has worked out incredibly well. There's been so many winners out that race further down the line. Um, And he went on to prove that form was no fluke by beating again a good field last time out at Newbury. Uh, you know, the likes of Solid Stone, uh, Fox Talent and, and D-Rab are certainly um, high-class horses in their own right. Whether he's a mile or a mile and a quarter horse, I don't know, but he's right in between here, isn't he? <laughs> mile one, you almost couldn't frame a, a better race for him. You know, he, is he a mile or is he a mile? Does he want him further or, or whatever? Right in the middle, absolutely bang on. Uh, it's just whether he handles a track. I don't know whether he'll like York. That's always a $64,000 question. And at 11 to 8... You're not getting great bang for your book. The, the one I, I do quite like, and I think he's overpriced, he also ran in the real-world Hunt Cup race at Ascot, and that's Brunch. Now, the one thing that Brunch does have in his favour is a CV to um, die for here at York. He's basically run here three times. He's won his first two starts, and he's second to Kinrun uh, here back in May. He won very nicely last time out, beating Ross Collin at... Um, at Pontefract. Now, Ross Collin um, was hugely unlucky, wasn't he? I think a few days later at, at Glorious Goodwood when he didn't get a clear run in the um, the Golden Mile. So I think his form lines are very, very good. I mean, obviously, he's got to find a little bit with real world. But the one thing he has got in his favour in, in, in a help to turn in the form around is his York form. Mm. You can't underestimate how York seems to just, um, um, in, you know, kind of, enhance horses um ability to run quicker um whether it's you know not too far for the horse to travel just the surface the, the layout of the track i don't know but brunch is a real big time operator here at this track and i think a mile one can end up being right up his street because he's always been doing his best work at the end over a mile, strongly run mile so yeah i think eight to one i would probably risk a few quid on him at that price but i'd also want to be backing him without the favorite on saturday Mm-hmm. Given that, given at the moment that he's like third or fourth in, he's probably going to be second or third favourite, and without the market, something in around I'm guessing here, around about the three to one mark. Okay. So yeah, I'd I'd be looking to get involved in brunch in some way, shape, or form. I guess the thing with Real World is obviously he holds entries in the QE2, the Champion Stakes. He clearly could be a Group One horse in the making, but it's whether he takes the track. Is that kind of your assessment? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, look, I've, I've got no hesitation with Real World like Space Blues saying, look, that's the right favourite based on form, based on their ability. But mm-hmm. like I say, sometimes it just comes, they come unstuck with these horses at York. It's just a funny track. I, I've, I've learned over the years just to be very wary of backing horses at short prices. They look as though they've got absolutely everything going for them. I mentioned Lou Sale on an early podcast. At least he's won at the track. So it kind of like, gives me a little bit more um, confidence in tipping a horse like that because they've run at the track before. But when they haven't, I, I'm p- quite prepared just to le- let them win at that price. Mm, okay. 
Right. So brunch for Andy in the Strensel Stakes, the opener. We've got three races then to finish the card. The 410 is the Julia Graves Rosier Stakes, a listed race for two year olds over five furlongs. Andy, this looks notoriously tricky. Anything in this? Um, I think it's interesting that um, Thunder Love hasn't run since um, winning early on in the season. She, she was very impressive first time at Kempton and then followed that up. She's a very, very pacey through it to you on. I thought she would have gone to Royal Ascot. She's obviously had a, a slight setback, the fact that she's been off the track for 108 days. Uh, but she's, she's got stall one now. We get more evidence to, uh, throughout the course of the week to see whether stall one's the place to be. But if that far side holds up, which it did on the first day, then um, I, I'd, I'd be mildly interested in her. The last two handicaps look very look very um, tricky, but I thought Fisher Ball ran really well um, in the uh, the John Smith Magnet Cup um, back in July when finishing fifth behind Johnny Drama. Wasn't particularly well drawn on that day and um, did some nice late work. I, I think he's of a mild interest in the um, in the 4:45 mm-hmm. and in, and in the final race briefly. Um, that that black rod of um, of Michael Dodds's uh, form has worked out incredibly well. He he won a very valuable race at Newmarket um, 44 days ago, and uh, we've seen several horses come out of that race and already prove that that um, is a very strong piece of form. So I'd imagine he'd be one of the market leaders come um, the last race on Saturday. So 4:45, Fisherball Franny in the Skybet handicap, and then will Black Rod be knocking at the door in the 5:20, the Skybet Apprentice handicap? So fascinating racing on the final day of the Welcome to Yorkshire Ebor Festival with the Skybet Ebor, the the feature race of the day. But Andy, your best bet of the day? My best bet of the day, um, I would probably. Oh, what's my best bet of the day? I'd probably say Brunch. Okay. I think I wish there was an extra runner. I wish there was eight runners because I'd I'd be pushing all my chips in each way on brunch. It. I'd 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 be I'd be I'd be disappointed if he's not in the first three. I I I bet you bottom dollar there'll be some firms play, paying uh, or, or betting on a three place top three finish. Hmm. Um, so I'll probably back him to win a top three finish, and I'll probably be backing him without the favourite. So, so I'd, I'd have to say brunch. William Buick on brunch for Michael Dodds in the opening Strensel Stakes. Thanks very much to Andy for his time. Good luck with any of your bets. Make sure you're still checking the Odds Checker app for all the best prices, odds, offers, and of course, Andy's tips every day of the Welcome to Yorkshire Ebor Festival. Fascinating action on the final day. Thanks for listening to the podcast this week, and we'll catch you very soon for more racing action and previews on the Odds Checker betting podcast. <laughs>